for Talking With Tech. My name is Chris Bouguet, and I'm here with Rachel Madel. How's it going, Rachel? It's good, Chris. I'm really excited. You know I love Talking With Tech days. I know, me too. And in fact, uh, at the time of this recording, we have not actually seen each other had a chance to talk in a while. So what's been going on? I'm really excited, Chris, because I've been doing this new thing in my practice, and I feel like it's a game changer. Okay, let's hear about it. What is it? So I've been doing AAC intensives. So uh, the kind of the genesis of this was I had heard a lot of colleagues, I'm in a lot of groups in Los Angeles with other practitioners, not necessarily just speech therapists, but education therapists, occupational therapists. And um, I was listening to an OT colleague of mine talking about how she does these intensives over the summer. And I always thought to myself, Ugh, like it doesn't feel like speech can do intensives because speech work is typically really challenging cognitively I feel like you're like super tired after a speech therapy session so I can't imagine doing like a three hour session with a kid um and even every day feels like kind of a lot so I always kind of like wrote it off like oh like I don't know if this is like right you know for you know the clients that I work with hold on a second can I clarify in the in the realm of what this person was talking about what is an intensive what is, how is that different than a regular session? So essentially you just like get really intense about the services that you're providing. I'm there. I'm intense. I actually, it, this fits my perf- my personality perfectly. I'm pretty intense generally speaking. So I'm like, oh, feel, it makes sense that I'd be doing these intensives. Um, so essentially if you see an occupational therapist or a speech therapist one time a week for 60 minutes, it's just you do a time period, one or two weeks where you're doing a lot of services, both more frequently and oftentimes longer sessions. Um, so it looks kind of different for, you know, whatever it is, the, the skills that you're working on, the, the domain that you're, you're in, um, the child, there's a lot of factors that are at play. Um, but I started doing these for AAC and it's been so amazing. So I was working with a family, essentially I've been seeing them every day for two weeks. We're just about to finish the end of this, the second week. And what I've been doing, it's all been virtual. And I've been working very closely with the whole team. So we've mapped it out so that I've had at least one session, but oftentimes two and sometimes three sessions with their behavior therapists, uh, any other speech therapist they might be working with, occupational therapist, teacher, parents. I've mapped it out so I've kind of hit everyone on the team. And I've been able to observe a session with them. Um, so they, you know, do what they normally do. And I'm kind of like a fly on the wall in the initial stages. And then we kind of come back together. Maybe the child goes on a break or does something fun. And I'm able to talk with the practitioner and kind of talk about what I saw, what I loved, what that they, they were doing. Of course, reinforce the positive things that they're doing. Um, give some suggestions for some ideas on how to facilitate language, um, how to use the device more, how to model, why, why modeling is so important. Um, not over prompting, you know, tempting kids with like their favorite things, keeping it motivating, fun, you know, all the things that we teach communication partners. But it's been so cool to see this intensive because I I have such a good picture of this this child. I've been working with this family for over a year now in a consultative role. So I've been working and doing, you know, kind of one-off like overlap sessions with uh, a behavior therapist here and there. But now that I've seen kind of the full picture of like, what is this child's week actually look like? And I've seen all of the people that are working with the student there's a lot of things that we need to change because also it's important to mention we started this because the the mom was like I feel like we're not making progress and I was like I kind of would agree like I feel like we need to be making more progress like if I see what's happening and I and I interface with everyone on the team that's the, the the surest way that we can start making progress or at least I can see what are the roadblocks here what's preventing progress from being made and let me tell you Chris like it is very clear with this specific student why progress progress isn't being made. Um, And essentially it's, they're not using the device enough. Like during, I I did a session yesterday, during a 30 minute session, the device was only used once. And this is a student who is minimally verbal, has a few approximations that are very unintelligible. And the device was only used once. 
And I'm like, okay, well, like we need to use the device more. Like that's part of this. Um, so anyway, it's been really interesting to see um, kind of a, a, it's been like a deep dive into one specific student. And I'm really excited because I have so many ideas of programs to kind of rewrite working alongside of the ABA um, to figure out programs they can run that can really move the needle. Um, because he's, he's, and I've also tracked spontaneous language, by the way, which I'm such a big believer in, you know, it, it, it really shows whether or not our intervention is working. If we can see what a student is saying on their own accord. So it's, I'm not, really that interested in you know the prompting and all the things like I have a lot of students that can like follow a model or follow a prompt but like what are they actually saying like what are they thinking in their head and then like going over to their device picking up and saying to us Um, and oftentimes when you actually look at that alone a lot of times kids aren't saying much like this specific kid is only saying I need a break the only thing he said spontaneously and he's only said it over the course of two weeks he's only said it uh seven times and i've i've you know done hours at this point of observing and working with you know uh communication partners and so that's the only thing he's saying on his own i need a break (laughs) which one shows his motivation right he's like i'm not really into this um But two, it's like, you know, we need to give him more words. We need to give him more language. We need to, you know, give him more exposure to language and opportunities. Um, But anyway, it's been really cool to see, like, now it makes sense. I'm like, oh, I wish I would have done this in the beginning because I would have understood what we were working with and I would have been able to really curate a program for him that ABA could start, you know, implementing so that the, he would have more success communication wise. Um, so anyway, it's been it's been eye opening, and I'm like, oh my god, this is my new favorite thing. Like, I need to do this with all my clients. So let me make sure I understand uh, what changed in in your approach. So what used to be, like you said, a consultation model, and it was kind of infrequently you'd touch base. You said for the next, and you kind of outlined, like the next two weeks, I'm going to do this intensive. And the intensive meant an hour a day with different people or even more than an hour a day. I'm still a little fuzzy. So for for this specific student, I've done 30 minute sessions every day for two weeks gotcha okay so I check in 30 minutes sometimes it went a little over sometimes I didn't need a full 30 minutes like I'm like oh I just saw you yesterday like how's it going let me check in um and I can anticipate that it would just depend on the team the child like the practitioner that I was working with their experience level I feel like there's a lot of things at play so I'm kind of trying to, to work out what it would look like um, and I think it would be dependent on a lot of different factors so it's not like I would do the same thing every time like I might see kids for longer sessions or you know what I mean like it just depends on like what's happening but yeah so it's it's for this specific student it's been 30 minutes a day for two weeks for two weeks and that 30 minutes is is the student always there it's always with the student, right? Because you're, con- it's not like you're brainstorming or consulting with each individual uh, other in person. You might be watching a session for 30 minutes and not, you're not the active person doing the session, right? Is that accurate? Right. So I kind of try to set the sessions up so that there's a little bit of observation so I can see what's going on. And then also there's a little bit of coaching. So, and, and the first week was different because it was like, hey, I'm Rachel. Like, you don't know me. And you might feel a little weird that I'm like watching your session. So like, let me make you, comfortable let me show you that like I'm here to help and collaborate and not just tell you what to do um so then once that rapport was established then it was like a little bit more coaching and you know I always ask people what their comfort level is I'm like listen I can like the same thing the same way I do when I supervise my clinicians it's like okay do you want me to jump in when I see something and kind of tell you you know on the fly what's going on do you want to debrief after like what makes you feel most comfortable um because it's different for everybody some people are like yes if you see me doing something like just jump in and tell me what else to do or how to do it different and other people feel like no I'd rather just talk about it after um so anyway it's kind of figuring that out with each person each communication partner and then um you know adapting but I think that the important thing for me was I do need to see you actually doing something um but I also need some time to talk with you and kind of do some teaching of basic principles and some give you some ideas um ultimately that was where 
that's where I think my my real genius comes in, right? Because I can tell people like the basics in like a webinar. I can be like, watch this. It'll teach you about core words. It'll teach you about modeling. But what I can really do is watch something being run, like a program for ABA, for example, or an activity that an SLP is doing. I could watch that and be like, oh, here's exactly what you can do. The exact same thing that you did this time, just tweak it a little bit or just add this or model this or here's a word you could work on during that activity. So I think that that's where it's really important that you know, I spend my time doing those types of things because this team, by the way, we've done a lot of training. Like we've, it's not like I'm just like, hey, like it's the first time you're like hearing from me. I've sent Loom videos uh, describing the importance of core words specific to, you know, this student. Um, but I think it's when you actually see someone doing something and you can actually give like real feedback on something specific. That's when like you start to see change, you know, when like people can actually be like, oh, like when I go outside, like I'll model go like that feels like I could do that. And I'm like, you probably can. You probably go outside multiple times when you're, you know, at the house and to take breaks. So just like model it on the device. This sounds great and actually lines up exactly with what we're trying to do. Um, maybe not such as the intensive, like all in two weeks, like uh, like this this focus in this short time frame. But um that whole idea of being a coach and and uh, showing up there and working with the communication partner in a real time job embedded situation where, like you said, I observe for a little bit and then maybe even sometimes uh, our coaches will do modeling or meaning here, watch while I do this and then you jump in or then ask those reflective questions. Hey, what do you think would happen if uh, what are you trying to get out of this? What, what do you what's what are your what's frustrating you about the situation? Um, those sorts of reflective questions is where the coaching comes in. And then it generalizes outside, like you said, hey, maybe you know Rachel's not here on my shoulder right now or with the video camera, you know, um, in the Zoom call or whatever. Uh, but I've been thinking about what she mentioned and how she made me think about it. And now I'm going to do that in more environments when she's not there. Exactly, which is ultimately the goal, right, is to just get people thinking through how can I use this device more? How can I integrate into things that I'm already doing, which is where I feel like I can be really helpful because it's really easy to, for a speech therapist to look at at an activity and be like, oh, there's like a lot of words that you could potentially model and a lot of things you could do, um, which is really helpful. And the collaborative approach really is the only way to do it when you're working with kids with complex communication needs. I mean, if you're doing things in a vacuum, you'll only have success in that vacuum, right? Like it's just, we really need to be strategic for for the kids that we're working with with AAC because everyone's kind of doing things and they're doing things a little different. And if we can all get on the same page, then that's when you really start to see progress being made. And the reason I like the intensive is because everyone, there's a buzz right now. Everyone's like, yeah, like I want to do this. Like I can't wait. And so it's like that collective energy really elevates us, right? It really makes change happen. And I think ultimately, like when you're working with a team and you're like, yes, like let's do this. We can make him, you know, communicate so much more with all of these strategies. It's like that collective energy really moves the needle and it, it, it makes change happen. And I think that change is what inspires people to keep going. It's like, wow, like he used the device, like, or he said go, or, you know, it's like those small things. And that's what keeps you, you know, doing the work. Cause essentially, you know, AAC is work. It's unfortunate, like if, but it's an extra step. It's like, okay, say it, but then also model it on the device. You know, it's work for everyone. It's work for the child. It's work for the parents and the communication partners. Um, you know, but it's, it's worth, it's work that's worth doing. It's important work. Um, but with that, it, it, you have to figure out a way to inspire people because otherwise it's just extra work and nobody feels like doing extra work. Um, now, if you're inspired, then you're motivated, like you're intrinsically motivated to do the extra work. And so I think that that's the benefit of the intensive is like everybody's excited and like on board. And there's this like feeling of like momentum that you have um, now that everyone's kind of like on the same page. And it's like, yes, we can do this. I love it. You know, you know, I love my analogies, right? And my metaphors. And so what this reminds me of, Rachel, is uh, I'm going to mix my metaphors and give you a couple, right? But it totally reminds me of like a, like a, um, like a meteor impacting the earth 
bam, right? Two, this big impact happens. And, and so for this, we have this intense moment of energy that makes everything change, you know? Um, or another uh, analogy would be, there, let's say there's some sort of vibe or hype around something happening in our culture right now. So, so for instance, at the time of this recording, Hamilton just came out on Disney Plus, and so there's this buzz about Hamilton, and everyone's singing the songs and talking about it, and you can't get away from it for like, and it's great, right? Because there's there's this like this spirit around this thing that everyone is talking about, and I bet you can think of other things like that 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 spike for a moment, and then eventually, you know, we're not always going to be talking about Hamilton. You know that that big impact that that uh, there's also a comet going by us right now. It, it won't be there forever, right? So people are talking about the comet. It, it, it comes, it spikes, and then it goes back down. And I feel like that's what you're trying to get at with your therapy, your intensive moment is let's get everybody on the same page. Let's get everyone talking about this. Let's get everyone excited about it. And then we'll have this, we'll all move. The needle will make this giant leap forward, and then we can keep that ball rolling. Does that sound right? That's exactly it. The other thing is like, I'm like, wow, I thought I knew this student. Like, I thought I knew this team. I thought I knew what this kid was doing. And I like really don't. (laughs) And I feel like that was another eye-opening thing is like, wow. Like, because I think when you do a lot of like consultative work, you're talking with a lot of communication partners. And I really needed to see it with my own two eyes to see what was happening. Because I think there's also some like things that get lost in translation. It's like, I'm like, Hey, what's he saying spontaneously? Like maybe someone doesn't understand what that means, you know? And like, maybe they're like, yeah, he's saying lots of things. And then I saw it and I was like, he's not <laughs> like, he's only saying I need a break. Um, so anyway, it like is really making me think through all of my clients and like what, especially the clients that are, you know, either not making the progress that I'd like to see, or, um, it feels a little bit slower. Like, I wonder if something like this could really, um, really help. Um, and we know that training communication partners, that's the way to make progress with AAC. So we know that. Um, so this is just kind of like a, a fast track to that instead of like six months, once a week, it's like, okay, let's do like, you know, a session every day for two weeks. Um, it's the same amount of time, but you know, I do think having it all put into, um, a one, you know, designated time period, um, it definitely gets the momentum going, which is really exciting. So it's something I'm now offering and I'm really excited about it. I like want all my clients to do it. Cause I'm like, yes, like I've seen so many like great things. And now I feel like I have such a good handle on the student and the, the plan going forward on how to really make progress here because I guess I didn't realize what was really happening with all of these sessions and all of the different team members. Now I have a good idea. So I feel feel like I can really inform um, what we're doing strategically so that we're able to see more progress. So this is your first client that you've tried this with, right? This is your alpha test, right? And you've seen such good results that you're excited to do it for the beta and move forward with this. Um, and I know I'm excited to hear those results as well. So we'll definitely have to, you know, talk about it in the future about, you know, how this grows from here and how many more clients and other experiences you have. I, I'm sure everyone would be interested in hearing how that works for you. I know I am. Definitely. I will keep you guys posted. Um, we're talking about coaching, Chris, and that's what this week's interview is about. So we were lucky enough to uh, be contacted by Allison. So Allison is a Talking With Tech listener, and she reached out and was curious if we did coaching calls. And Chris and I hopped on and we were like, yes, like, are you willing to record this for the podcast? And she agreed. And so the episode you're about to hear is us doing a clinician coaching call. So Allison is a speech language pathologist, and she had some some trouble with a student in particular who she she just felt like she was at a standstill. She didn't know where to go next with her therapy. She had some some roadblocks that were preventing her her client from making progress. And so basically Chris and I coached her on how to, you know, think about things through maybe a different lens. Um, we gave her some clinical ideas to try. Um, we definitely used our reflective questions, Chris, and our coaching strategies that we always talk about. Um, so I'm really excited to share this episode because um, I think it's it's going to be really helpful for everyone um, because I'm sure there's a lot of people out there listening who have clients very similar to Allison's um, who maybe aren't making as much progress as you'd like to see. And um, yeah, I think we had a really good discussion with her. 
So there's two things I'd like to point out about this particular interview that you're about to hear. The first one is, is that if you're a Patreon supporter, and you can be a, become a Patreon supporter by going to patreon.com slash talking with tech. But if you're already a Patreon supporter, this was already in the Patreon. We released this uh, a couple months ago, actually, uh, by the time this come, is going to be released. So you may have heard this before. If you haven't, this is the first time you're hearing this, I'm going to suggest that you actually listen to it twice. The first time, just listen to it once, listening to the strategies they come up with, uh, just just like any other episode. But then, Rachel, what you just said, I think it could be a whole other way that people listen to it, which is listening to the way we phrase our re- re- our responses to, to Allison. Because if you are trying to be a coach, you could try and look at it from that lens, like or even pause it when an Allison says something and ask yourself, okay, how would I respond, you know, and then go back and listen to see how we did it. Not that we're all perfect or anything, you know, just that uh, as a compare and contrast. I think that's a, a very useful way to use this particular episode. I could not agree more. Um, I think that you're you're right, Chris. There was a lot of moments where we could have started explaining everything that Allison should do, right? Like, and and don't get me wrong, I probably a few times was like, here's what you should do, Allison. Have you thought about this? Um, but there's a lot of moments where we were really cognizant of that and we kind of you know shifted shifted it back to her and I think she was a little taken back sometimes like well I don't know like why are, why are they asking me a question <laughs> so anyway it's definitely worth thinking through yeah I like the idea Chris of listening to it once through just kind of listening and then going back and kind of doing an exercise um, how would I respond uh, to this to this problem because she's talking about a lot of the roadblocks that she was experiencing um, it's easy to try to give solutions but it's more more beneficial to have someone think through their own solutions, um, which is the whole point of reflective coaching and um, reflective questions. So um, yeah, really excited about this one. So without further ado, let's listen to our interview with Allison Bono. Black women and girls of color are underrepresented in professions related to science, technology, engineering, and math, also known as STEM for short. Imagine the impact changing this fact could have not only on the lives of black women and girls of color, but on the world as a whole. Young and preteen girls of color need more experiences and opportunities to learn technology and computer programming skills that can fuel curiosity, ingenuity, and passion. With the proper guidance, inspiration, and mentorship, Black girls and girls of color can become leaders in fields related to STEM. Black Girls Code is an organization that has a singular mission. It aims to introduce programming and technology to a new generation of coders, coders who will become builders of innovative technologies and of their own futures. Go to blackgirlscode.com to learn more about how you can volunteer or donate to support their mission. Black Girls Code is working to increase the number of women of color in the digital space by empowering girls of color ages 7 to 17 to become innovators in STEM fields, leaders in their communities, and builders of their own futures through exposure to computer science and technology. They are working to provide African-American youth with the skills to occupy jobs related to computing and to train 1 million girls by 2040. Check out their website at blackgirlscode.com or follow them on Twitter at blackgirlscode to learn about upcoming events, volunteer opportunities, apparel, and so much more. With your help, Black Girls Code will reach their goal and will see millions of young women of color achieve their dreams and change the world for the better. You can make a difference by going to blackgirlscode.com today. If you enjoy this podcast, we would love your support to keep it going. You can become a VIP listener by joining our Patreon community. Your contribution allows us to cover the costs of this podcast and pay our team for all of their hard work. You also can get some really awesome bonus content with behind the scenes videos, new tech related therapy ideas, and lots of other perks we reserve only for our Patreon. To join us, go to patreon.com backslash talking with tech. Welcome to Talking With Tech, this coaching episode. And so uh, today, Rachel, we have someone named Allison with us. How's it going, Allison? Doing pretty well. How about you guys? 
Great, great. Uh, I mean, we should be upfront that we are recording right now in the middle of the pandemic, and you are our first coaching call that we're doing like this. So it's a big, grand experiment how everything's going to go. I'm excited so to be a part of this. <laughs> so, Allison, can you just you know start off by telling us kind of who you are, where you practice, um, and then we'll kind of get into to the specifics. Sure. Um, so I actually just recently got my C's um, last April. So I'm fairly new to the field. I am a speech therapist in New Jersey. Um, so my first year I worked for a contract agency um, in a school district. And then I just started working uh, full time in another district this past September. Um, I also started working in an outpatient as well. So I'm getting, you know, a lot of experience um, in different environments, which has been uh, really awesome. So last year, I was thrown into working with, um, you know, children on the spectrum, and I had no experience in grad school. So I started my first day, got my assignment, and it was scary, you know, it was something totally new. Um, but I feel like it was awesome to kind of get that experience from the beginning, because, you know, I had to kind of just you know, figure, figure my way through it. So it was an awesome experience and kind of set me up for where I am now. You know, I feel a lot more confident with um, what I'm doing and learning every day. So it's been, it's been a challenge, but it's also been really rewarding so far. Amazing. And so did you start listening to, you started listening to our podcast, I'm guessing, cause that's how you found us. Well, how did you find our podcast? Um, I think I honestly was just looking online. I was looking for a different podcast. And since I had started working with AAC last year and it was something totally new to me, you know, I really wanted, you know, to learn as much as I could. And, you know, reading online is awesome, but I'm definitely more of like an auditory learner. So, you know, being able to drive to work in the morning, listening to the podcast was definitely a great way to kind of help me learn. And, you know, with the time that I had to, which was really nice. So congratulations on the C's, by the way, Thank you. <laughs> and graduating and getting multiple jobs, it sounds like, right? So that's awesome. Congratulations. Thank so you. You wanted to talk about one kind of case in particular, though, at one of your schools. Is that accurate? Yes. So my question that I have is ultimately, you know, a question that I can kind of relate to a lot of my students, but I definitely started thinking a lot more about this when I was working with a particular child um, that I'm working with currently. Okay. So let's dive in. Tell us awesome. about this child and we'll, you know, kind of start breaking it apart and then putting it back together. Awesome. All right. So when I started working in this new district um, in September, I started working with um, this one kindergarten student and he was in the preschool disabled program prior um, before I was working there. And to my knowledge, he didn't have any form of AAC or any visual supports that he was really utilizing to communicate. Um, so when I started working with him, you know, we were really working from the ground up. Um, and at that point, he was, you know, using a lot of single words while imitating. So he wasn't really using much consistently on his own. Um, but, you know, when we were in the session, it was, you know, I would say a word, he would imitate back to me. But we were also really working um, on his engagement in the beginning. So, you know, within the classroom, within the session, it was really hard to find what motivated him to use his language. And, you know, from my past experience, you know, last year, seeing how, you know, you really have to find what's motivating for the child in order for them to communicate. Um, so this was definitely a big challenge for myself for the classroom teacher, you know, really working together and trying to find out, you know, what is going to motivate him to use his language. Um, so we found arts and crafts and, you know, story reading are two things that he really, really enjoys. Um, and, you know, literacy is something that I try to incorporate with all of my students, but, you know, specifically him, I really wanted to hone in on that. So <laughs> um, I started by implementing a core board that I had found that I use with many of my students, you know, many of my minimally verbal, my verbal, you know, it's something, you know, it has a lot of our core words on there to really kind of help him um, use some of that functional language. So you know, in the beginning of the year, it was a lot of hand over hand. It was a lot of that modeling and imitating. Um, and, you know, within the past few months, we have seen a lot of progress. We have found, you know, a lot of those engaging and motivating activities for him. Um, he loves tickles. He loves jumping on the trampoline. So, you know, a lot of our session is that, you know, using those really functional motivating activities to get him to use language. Um, and the use of the core board has been really, really great. You know, I haven't seen him use it so much independently, but it's also helping him, you know, verbalize more as well. So I'm not doing as much hand over hand with him. Um, I can model and he will almost follow along and imitate on the core board as well. Um, and he is using his one word spontaneously independently, which is awesome. 
So from September to now, he's definitely using a lot more, you know, functional one word. And he's starting to use some two word phrases. Um, so I've really been working on those functional two words. So when we get to the room, having him open the door. So open door. Um, when we're jumping on the trampoline, working on help me jump. When he wants tickles, working on functional tickle me. So trying to work on those functional phrases in his environment. He is doing well, but when he's back in the classroom, you know, if there's no demands placed on him, he really will not communicate independently. So that's really where my struggle is because, you know, on one end, I see how much progress he has made. He went from not really speaking at all to now using one word and starting to use those two words on his own. But then you think of, you know, where he should be for his language and, you know, should I be, you know, providing more support for him and switching to something more like a high tech device to kind of help progress the language. So that's kind of where I'm stuck and, and not really sure where to go from there. I have a question. So you're saying he's imitating. When you say that, is he imitating you by touching the word that you're touching on the communication board? Or is he imitating you by verbalizing what he sees you touching on the communication board? So he's doing a little bit of both. So we're working on, you know, me modeling and providing the verbal model as well. And then he's kind of following after that and he's touching and then giving the verbal word as well. Okay. Gotcha. And what kinds of words are, is he using? I love how you talked about the motivation is obviously so important. Um, so he loves tickles. He loves sensory. He loves arts and crafts. Like what kinds of words is he saying spontaneously? Um, so we're working on read. So when he comes in, we're talking about we're going to read a story. So he is able to say read. We're working on eat. Um, he does, you know, even at home through teletherapy now, I've seen that he really is motivated by food as well. So I've been working a lot on eat and working on those two word utterances like eat cracker, um, which he's starting to do. Um, and then we also were working on simple in and on as well. So trying to focus more on those verbs and those um, more abstract concepts versus nouns because he has a lot of nouns in his vocabulary. Allison, I'm gonna ask you to describe what the phrase working on means. Can you describe that a little bit more? Like when you say um, we're, we are working on um, two word phrases and he's saying uh, open door. What does that look like? So it really started off, you know, when we're walking up to the session and, you know, it started with me providing him that full model and not really expecting too much from him. Um, and this is something I try to talk about with my parents too, especially through the teletherapy now, you know, it's okay if they're not going to say it after you. They need to hear these things multiple times before, <laughs> before they start. So don't feel the pressure to say, say this, say that. So that's been something, you know, that I've learned that I am not always, you know, expecting them to say it after me. So as we're working through those motivating activities, you know, I am providing the model of those words, but not necessarily expecting to get much back from him, but with the repetition of, you know, doing a lot of the similar, you know, same activities every time, then I'm starting to see more of that spontaneity on his part. Yeah, you just kind of back off a little bit and then suddenly he, he fills in what you've done many times for him beforehand. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, okay. Awesome. Thank you. And so you're modeling on the communication board, correct? Like when you say you're giving language models, it's not just verbally, right? It's, correct. It's verbally and on the communication board, which is a huge thing, right? We know children with autism, especially when it comes to abstract language, they benefit from seeing, you know, a, an icon or even sometimes, you know, the, the written word, um, mm -hmm. they, they benefit from from seeing the visual of that paired with our auditory output, paired with us actually saying the word. Um, mm -hmm. So it's great that you're giving that language model. Um, let's keep progressing down that, right? So you go open the door and are, I'm guessing for a core board, you're, you're just modeling the word open, correct? Yeah, so actually for open board, uh, open door, we haven't even used the core board for that. That's kind of just been the verbal okay. model. And then once we get into the session, we'll start using the core board. And I also will do sign language with him as well. So I do a lot of sign language mm -hmm. with my kids as well, working on open, you know, help in on. Um, so I incorporate that as another visual of support for the children too. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Rachel. No, <laughs> I got more I, I questions. Lost, but oh, you, you, you want me to go? <laughs> yeah, you go. Okay. So here'd be my question is, can you describe what this core board looks like? You said it's kind of like a universal one you use with a bunch of kids. What, how many words are on oh, there? She's, and She's going to show us. 
Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> I have it Great. for you. <laughs> I have got She's like, I was just doing telepractice all day. So like it's right I here. <laughs> everything in my living room. Um, so it's very simple. You know, when I'm working on pronouns with some of my kids and then mm -hmm. we have you know, some of your basic verbs. Mm -hmm. uh, I have yes, no at the top for my kids that I'm working on yes, no questions. And then right. we have some of those spatial concepts. So, you know, it is very, very effective. I found, I actually found this through Lesson Picks, um, mm -hmm. a site that I use to get a lot of my visual strategies. And I felt that it was really effective because I am able to use that core board within, you know, any activity that I'm doing with them. And I think even when I'm educating parents, I'm showing them like this board can be used when you're working on arts and crafts, when you're working on doing a puzzle, when you're working on blocks, it's not specific to any activity, which has been super, super helpful versus having to print out a different board for every single activity that you're working on. Mm -hmm. Which is the beauty of core words, right? <laughs> it's like, that's why we use core words. That's why we, you know, really emphasize that in our field, specifically, you know, with AAC is that like, we need to be modeling the, the words that can be used for lots of different activities and lots mm -hmm. of different routines. Um, so yeah, that's exactly why we use a core board, right? Because mm -hmm. it can be used, you know, in so many different opportunities throughout mm -hmm. a child's day. Yeah, which I wasn't even really familiar with core language last year when I had first started working with students and I was working on nouns, nouns, nouns all the time. And, you know, we I wasn't really getting anywhere with them. You know, we were working on the simple requesting for, you know, the highly motivating toys. But um, I actually worked for another school over the summer um, for a special education school. And that's where I really like dove into my knowledge with core words. And ever since then, I feel like it's definitely, you know, really helped me so much as a clinician, you know, when I'm working with students to focus more on that. Mm -hmm. So what do you think comes next? <sighs> well, that's, that's where I need your help. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so, you know, the biggest challenge for me is now seeing, you know, I'm seeing this progress, but again, this is providing a lot of that core language, but again, is limiting, you know, because it can only provide so much. So now, you know, I don't know whether to, you know, move up and try something high tech that can provide more of that, more of that language opportunity for him, you know, or to stay with something low tech. That's, mm -hmm. you know, my dilemma right now. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you, why is your brain going to high tech? I think he needs high tech. I think I just see that, you know, see where the limitations lie right now. And I see that, you know, although he is doing well, I feel like providing with more language and having more of the opportunity to use more language is going to help, you know, because once we do, you know, master at least all these words, then there's always going to be more, you know, so I think I, I'm just kind of looking ahead <laughs> and, you know, seeing what the next step would be because I'm not sure, you know, what to look for when I'm thinking about high tech versus low tech. All right. Well, let me ask you this. What would be the downside to, to high tech? Do you see any cons to uh, uh, that approach? No, definitely not. I definitely, you know, think that it's going to only help if anything. I did bring actually with a student, I did bring, I have an iPad uh, myself in the classroom and I did bring it in for him and just kind of, met, you know, play around with it and see how he did with it. And he did do fairly well with it. Um, so that's why I think it kind of sparked my idea. You know, if this is something that he could potentially do well with, you know, should I kind of run with it and continue with that? Or should I continue with the approaches I have now? and see where that goes. I'm sorry, did you say which app you used on the iPad? You didn't, right? You no, didn't say that. <laughs> so I use Proloquo. I, I've been yep. using Proloquo with him. Gotcha, so you just, you opened it up to Proloquo, you kind of picked uh, um, an, an array and said, oh, let's try this and see how, if he takes to it or like throws it across the room or like, nah, I don't want that, you know, and, <laughs> and he was, he, he kind of reacted to it? Yeah, he was very, he was very engaged with it. Um, he was a little territorial over it once I gave it to him. <laughs> um, but he did a really nice job. You know, we worked on, I had a wind up toy with him. So we were working on Go. Um, and I did just show him some simple animal cards. And he did a really nice job with navigating into the folders within the first two times I tried it with him. Um, so I definitely did see some success, which was, you know, really enlightening and awesome. Um, so that's kind of why it sparked, you know, maybe I should try something high tech with him. And the auditory feedback oftentimes I find, especially for students with autism is huge when they can touch something and hear that auditory feedback. I, it like it, 
helps them approximate words and say words. It helps them, you know, formulate more complex sentences. Um, So your head's in the right place as far as like thinking long-term, which we always talk about on this podcast. Like, (laughs) you know, we don't want to think about just right now. We need to think long-term. What Mm -hmm. kinds of supports can we start implementing with students that, you know, give us long-term success? Um, So your your head's definitely in the right place. Um, As far as the, I want to talk through a little bit of the the lack of spontaneous language, right? The, the, cause I think that that's a huge thing that you brought mm-hmm. up, right? And we mm-hmm. see that with a lot of students with, with autism. Um, we know that their motivation sometimes is hard to figure out and fleeting mm-hmm. at times. Um, mm-hmm. It sounds like you found a lot of really great activities. So I kind of want to walk through what's happening in your sessions um, and, and, and talk through it because I feel like there's probably some strategies you can start implementing to, increase his spontaneous language. Um, so let's talk about, you know, let's, let's take like a really motivating activity. Cause I feel like we talked about open the door, which, you know, maybe is motivating if there's something really cool inside that he really likes, um, but maybe isn't as motivating. So let's pick an activity that he's super, super excited about. Okay. So he loves to color and he loves to cut things and paste. Um, so that's why I think it's also kind of helped him to enjoy book reading a little bit more because he knows that once the story is over, then he's going to get that motivating activity as well, which has helped with that requesting of when we are doing the activity of him able to request, you know, the items that he needs to complete the activity, um, and stuff like that. So that's, you know, the arts and crafts has been a big focus in our session to kind of help with that motivating piece. And let's, just a little more information. What are the kinds of language targets you're using during those activities? So, you know, once I start it, if say, for example, we're working on building a snowman, Mm -hmm. so we'll start with the different parts of the snowman. Um, When we're putting them on the paper, we'll talk about, you know, little on the top, we'll talk about big on the bottom. So working on those qualitative concepts, Mm -hmm. Uh, you know, then I have him, you know, requesting the glue and then we're working on put on, Um, So working on those two word phrases put on, Mm -hmm. Um, then we're talking about, you know, when he's putting his eyes on, we're talking about eyes go on his face. So working on those two word phrases on face, Um, putting the scarf on, talking about on neck, putting hat on, talking about on head. Um, So really trying to think of those functional two words and he will utilize them when it's in that type of structured context, since that's an activity that he is really motivated by and, and enjoys. That's where we're seeing more of that spontaneous language. So what do you think would happen? Is he motivated by like devices like like iPads or like YouTube videos or things that most kids are motivated by? So he loves Mickey Mouse videos, um, but the teacher uses that a lot in the classroom. Mm -hmm. So I didn't want to bring that into the session because I didn't want it to be something that then he gets bored of and doesn't want to do it anymore. Completely. Here's where my head's going with that. Um, I'm trying to think of a another activity with the word on. And I'm wondering if he would use that word on his own. If he would, you know, see me about to, you know, I, I'm trying to think of a good example of, of on. Um, the, the first thing that came to my mind was like turning an iPad on or a TV mm-hmm. on or something like that, turning the lights on. Um, if he saw me about to do that and I paused, do you think that he would use that word? I don't. Um, yeah, that's what I assumed. Um, I feel like, by the way, Allison, like, I feel like you're talking about all my kids right now. So I'm like, I feel you, girl. Like, I know exactly this kid you're talking about. I know this kid. I know this kid. Exactly. Like, I saw this kid an hour ago via telepractice. Um, so anyway, I completely understand. Um, so one thing, one question I'd ask then is if he's not using the word on spontaneously in novel routines or, Mm -hmm. sorry, in novel situations, Mm -hmm. What do you think about instead of, you know, having him say put on, maybe pairing that back to say just on, on, right. To teach that concept before we, you know, kind of, of course we can scaffold or we can, you know, model up and say put on, um, but you know, with the expectation that he's, he's just learning that single word. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? No, I think that definitely makes, that definitely makes a lot of sense. So just scaling it back and until he learns the true concept of the word on, you know, then adding additional words, but kind of putting the demands on to just use that one word, I think would definitely be helpful. 
Well, right. And because what happens is if we, if we, first of all, kids with autism are great at learning routines, right? It's like Mm -hmm. they got the glue down and they're like, you know, glue on and all these things, which is good at some level. Um, But what we have to think about, you know, as clinicians is we want to make sure that we're teaching language that can be generalized to novel situations. Definitely. Um, Generative language, right, is what our ultimate goal is. Um, And so, you know, while you can work on, you know, routine things that we know he loves, Mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure that you kind of start incorporating, you know, some other types of activities into the mix um, and, and, you know, kind of the the way that I see it is with, with the kids that I work with is I don't want to make it, you know, so complex that they just, you know, resort to memorizing, you know, two words together and then just regurgitating it in routine, Mm -hmm. but Mm -hmm. they're not actually using, you know, a single word in that phrase. Um, And so I I wonder if we, you know, scaled it back a bit and targeted just on, and we targeted in lots of different motivating activities, just that single word, I wonder what would happen. Yeah, no, I think that's definitely a good idea. I mean, even the phrase, you know, I want, I don't teach that <laughs> because <laughs> God, <laughs> I don't even go near it <laughs> because of that reason. So, mm-hmm. so applying that to this, I think that would definitely be a good thing to kind of scale it back now and, and think of other ways that I can incorporate on into the daily routine mm-hmm. um, and see if he can then, you know, apply that. You know, I think it's definitely also challenging, you know, when you're working to kind of try to educate the teachers on the phrases and the, 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 the concepts that you're teaching them, because I think mm-hmm. a lot of times they are focusing more on those nouns and those, those simple words. So, you know, I've been trying to, to kind of, you know, have the teachers can incorporate that within the classroom too. And that's definitely been a challenge and same with parents too. It's, it's hard to explain to them that, you know, it's great that they can say cow, pig, horse, you know, and all that, but then trying to focus on those other words too, you know, trying to get everyone on board with that as well. I, I want to jump in here with, um, since we were talking about the word on, um, in that specific, and I know Rachel, what you're really getting at there is that that's just an example of, of others, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but <laughs> on in particular is so tricky and there's a lots of words because we often think of it as two meanings, right? Like, uh, here's my phone and it is now sitting on my computer. It's a, it's an object resting on top of another object, mm-hmm. or it means to, um, to activate, you know, I've turned on the light i've turned on the computer um the 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 trick thing with on i find when you really get into uh, the the weeds of linguistics and which is and why i really love what you're doing allison as far as modeling goes like i'm gonna i'm going to show it a bunch of times before i have an expectation that he would do it is that um well i could go on and on you see that the, that when I use it in that phrase, well, suddenly that's not either of those two previous ones, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm on it. You know, how many times does someone write that or say that, which means I'm starting it or I'll do it for you. And again, and those are just two of many others. You, he's on medication or you're on time. You know, those are two different ways of using on, which I know is way beyond where we're talking about for this kid um, mm-hmm. right now. But if, since you said, like, I really want to be thinking about him down the line, then these are the times where you could be modeling those words as well, just to show him, like, these are other ways that that word is used. Mm -hmm. So just a side note, because I want to bring it back to another question for you, which is I'm getting the impression that you see him in like a therapy room. Is that accurate? Or do you see him in his kindergarten classroom or paint the picture of what, where you're, where you're spending your time with him? So I actually do a little bit of both. Um, so two of his sessions we spend, I pull him out and I take him into a therapy room. And then we also do a group session. I co-treat with the occupational therapist and we do work, um, in the classroom as well, which then gives us the opportunity to, you know, educate the teachers and the aides, um, you know, during those simple activities and those motivating activities, you know, how we can model that and those words during, during that time. Gotcha. Okay. So do you find like the, the other teachers or the teacher there gets to see you do your work? You know what I mean? Or is it sort of separated? It's a little <laughs> bit of both, <laughs> you, know, okay. you know, back to what I said about it being a challenge. I think in the beginning of the year, it was kind of like, all right, so when we go into the classroom, it's time for 
me and the occupational therapist to do our job. And then when we leave, then the rest of the team kind of goes back and works with the kids. Um, but I think, you know, the occupational therapist and myself have kind of done a good job at trying to, you know, incorporate them within the activities too. And it's tough because, you know, we're young and they are older than we are. So that's, you know, the barrier of trying to educate people, but not really trying to step on toes. <laughs> while yeah, it's hard. It. Yeah, yeah, there's it's egos involved. <laughs> definitely. Um, so I definitely think, having that time when we are pushing in and and doing those activities definitely does help with that educational piece, but, but it's tough, you know, it's been a challenge for sure. Do you find that the core board gets used in multiple environments? Um, Yes and no. Um, You know, I've incorporated it within the classroom and, you know, sometimes when I am in there, I will see it being used, but not consistently. Um, You know, I shared it with uh, this particular student goes to outpatient therapy as well. So I did share it with the outpatient therapist to utilize. Um, I shared it with mom and, you know, the one plus side of doing teletherapy now is I'm doing a lot of parent training with them as well. So really being able to show mom how she can incorporate with that at home, because I think when they first see something like that, it's scary as a parent, you know, you don't really know what to do with it. You're not really sure how to do it. So, you know, through teletherapy, I feel like I've really been able to sit and work with the parents, but you know, this particular parent, she was saying, you know, now that he is starting to talk, she said, should I not use the core board at all anymore? So then really working on that educational piece as well and and showing her that it's great that he is using a lot of that language spontaneously, but we want to see how we can further assist him, you know, as we move forward too. Sorry, Rachel, I can't have another question, but I was waiting for you to... (laughs) Uh oh, we lost Rachel. Sorry, I um, <laughs> there's some background noise going on, so I had to send some messages to my upstairs <laughs> neighbors. Um, <laughs> but yeah, sorry, I did not mean to to interrupt our our flow. Um, okay. I was going to ask uh, a question about uh, core word of the week. Have you ever implemented a core word of the week type of strategy in a classroom? I have not. Um, I did look into that in the beginning of the year um, to do with some of my preschoolers. Mm -hmm. Um, And I'm going to be blunt and honest. I started it and then I stopped. (laughs) Listen, Uh I start a lot of things and I stop. (laughs) This is a judgment-free zone, Allison. It is. That's like, because we know the reality of being in classrooms and having huge caseloads. And it's like, we have all these aspirations to do all these great things. Mm -hmm. But the reality is like, we're just like trying to survive oftentimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, So listen, yeah, this is a judgment-free zone. Mm -hmm. Um, (laughs) The reason I asked is because that can be a really systematic way that, um, you know, really, targets and hones in on vocabulary for for students but also for for paraprofessionals and teachers mm-hmm. um, it just simplifies the process because you know as speech language pathologists we're like we're language people right we're like yeah all the words like i'm not yes. this word and that word <laughs> we know how to model language that's what mm-hmm. we are trained to do but mm-hmm. oftentimes parents and teachers and paraprofessionals it does not come easy to them and so core word of the week is a really great strategy to just you know start with one word right? Simplify mm-hmm. it so that it, it's easy. Um, you know, you can help walk teachers through how to integrate one word into their daily routine, you know, looking at the, the schedule of the classroom and being like, you know, great. Like it's time for him to put his coat on because it's time to go outside. Great. You know, we can, we can use the word on during that art activity. Um, there's lots of different ways that you can start helping teachers start thinking through the core word, right? Because that's the hardest part for people who are not familiar with core words. We, we, it's easy to think through nouns, right? And concrete. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's hard to think the abstract. It's hard to think core words, even though that's what we use. Um, it's challenging oftentimes. Um, so I think maybe a core word of the week strategy could be really effective. Now, do you think, here's my question for you. So if you do implement something like core word of the week, do you really st- you know, not t- technically stick to it, but will you actually stay with one word and then move on to a new word the next week? Or will you kind of start one word and work on that for a few weeks and then move forward? Because, you know, we don't want to overwhelm the teachers and the aides and the student as well. So completely. And I think that you, you answered your own question, right? You, you do whatever works for that classroom. Um, mm-hmm. And it depends on the language level of the students. I would say, you know, when I'm first starting off more, having more than a week for, you know, 
people to get familiar with the word and how to target it makes a lot of sense. Um, you know, it's this balancing act that I'm constantly doing because I'm oftentimes recommending things like word of the week because uh, I work very closely with school teams, even though I'm in private practice. And, you know, sometimes it's, it's like, you know, it's balancing, like we want exposure to a lot of different words, but we also want to have success. And mm -hmm. so, you know, sometimes we have to limit the exposure to words in order to have that success. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's just like using your clinical judgment to figure out like, wow, these teachers feel really overwhelmed right now. Like I'm not going to switch the word, right? Like I'm just going to okay. fit with on, mm -hmm. like just keep what you're doing. And then, you know, building on when, you know, you feel that teachers and paraprofessionals paraprofessionals and, and, and parents feel like they can, you know, they can start, you know, continuing to go forward. Okay. Allison, I think it might be helpful to, to, um, I'm going to consult here, right? I'm going to give you some advice, which is to see if the teacher would mind planning with you or, and, and coming up with a schedule for, all right, when we get back to the classroom, <laughs> which might be the beginning of the next school year, but right? you know what I mean? Um, we're going to plot out the first quarter together and we're going to try and put these on dates. Like this week is going to be this word. This week we're going to get at least the first quarter done and you mm -hmm. can always pivot and adjust and make adjustments just like Rachel was saying. I think that's great advice. Like, yeah, you know what? Everyone was sick this week. So we're going to stick, uh, you know, or, you know, we, uh, New Jersey, you get snow, you know what I mean? So, Hey, we mm -hmm. had a bunch of snow days, so we're going to pivot or people are just aren't feeling it or whatever. Um, you can make adjustments, but at least you have a plan. And if you plan with them, then it's not your plan that you're imposing. It's them with you collaboratively doing it together. Okay, that definitely makes sense. And now my other question for you. So in terms of symbol set, so say I have kids that are in the classroom and they're using Proloquo, um, you know, but I have access to lesson picks, which is a different symbol set, but I want to be able to provide the teacher with those visuals within the classroom. You know, I read a lot of conflicting information, you know, as long as you're provided like aided, uh, aided language input, you know, it, it doesn't matter the symbol set. And then I've also, you know, heard the opposite that, you know, if a child's learning with the Proloquo symbol set, you want to stick with that. Um, so I guess you guys could touch a little bit on that and, and the importance of that. Chris, I, Chris, do you, have, do you have the answer? I, I have, I have. So I don't, I'm not sure it's as important. Oh. Sorry. Uh, I'm not sure that the symbol set is, is quite the, the key there. I think the key might be where the symbols are located. So what I mean by that is uh, this student is, is familiar with the lesson picks core board. And when you introduce prolo quo, those are going to be in different, all the words are going to be in different places from where that lesson picks one was. So mm -hmm. a, a next step, a next logical step for this particular student might be to introduce a screenshot if you don't have prolo quo for him to try, but to transition him from the lesson picks board to a prolo quo board, if you will. Um, and then again, you're nodding, which makes me think you, and you are already, I think already at the, at the phase where you're thinking, yeah, this, I need to go pro low quo, or I need to go at least high tech. Um, right. I, mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so this would be a, a transition over. Uh, and if you, do you already have students in that kindergarten classroom or at that school that are using pro low quo? Um, I do not, uh, I have one student that is using Proloquo. I'm sorry. Um, I have one student that's using an iPad right now um, and is using Proloquo as of now. Okay. Does it make sense what I'm saying that it's probably not the symbols so much as the but location? But more about the location. Yeah, that yeah. definitely makes sense, especially because that was one of my other challenges this year is that in my preschool class, I did incorporate, you know, the lesson picks core board as well, but I do, I am starting to trial the iPad with a few of them. So I was kind of, you know, on the fence with if that was okay, that I was introducing a different symbol set and now I'm introducing this. So definitely worrying about the location makes more sense. Let me ask you this. What would be the pros and cons of just using a Prolo Quo core board essentially a screenshot of one of the, as opposed to the lesson picks, what advantages does the lesson picks core board give you over the Prolo Quo core board or some other system core board? Yeah, I don't think it's necessarily the advantage that one would have over the other. I think that I had just started exploring with this one and kind of had just started implementing and then I didn't know if it would be confusing to the child if I did switch over to a yeah. Prolo Quo core board because I was already exposing them to that. So, you know, I didn't want to just switch it up. Yeah, I think there might be a moment or a, 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 a small adjustment period like, wait, where are these again? But then once that 
goes away, mm -hmm. now you've opened a door to when you get to um, higher deck, then I don't have to look for them again. Oh, I'm familiar with this. This is in the mm -hmm. same spot, roughly, you know? Mm -hmm. Definitely. That definitely. And I, think, I, and I think what Chris is touching on here is, again, we're circling back to the long-term solutions, right? We're circling back to like, you know, what can we do right now that sets up sets us up for long-term success. Um, mm -hmm. Knowing that, you know, maybe some students who start using AAC won't always use AAC, but we always need to think with that in our minds so that we really set students up for success, um, you know, especially when it comes to motor planning, which is why, and I wanted to chime in there, that's why we care about the location, right, is because children learn the locations for all of those words. And so, you know, like Chris mentioned, it might be a little adjustment period, like, you know, yes was always at the top, but now on this new board, it's at the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. You know, children will eventually figure that out. They have to relearn the motor plans, though. So it does make sense to me to, you know, start with a core board that looks like a high-tech device so that all of that motor planning and all of that learning is already happening. And then mm -hmm. the, the transition to a high tech device is, is very seamless. Okay. That definitely makes sense. Awesome. Do you have any other questions for us? Um, I know we, we've kind of talked about a lot and it's been really good to kind of dive in and definitely. <laughs> go through all of this. This has been super fun. It's been super helpful for me too. You know, I love to collaborate with other therapists and, you know, when I was able to reach out to you and get that, it was, you know, such an exciting opportunity for me because, you know, I always want to hear other people's perspectives because I feel like, especially in our field, there are a lot of different perspectives. So, you know, when you're researching online, you're always reading different things and hearing different things. So, you know, I like to tackle things from different angles. So, uh, cool. cool. Allison, before we, we wrap up here, let me ask, so what are your, some of your takeaways? What did you think about this whole like, you know, last 45 minutes. I noticed I saw you writing stuff down. What were some of the things <laughs> you wrote down? And I'm very curious which, uh, what you feel like your next steps are going to be. So I think I definitely want to work on scaling back a little bit, you know, especially with this specific child. And I know that I'm doing that a lot with my other students too, um, you know, really sp focusing on, you know, those specific core words, you know, one word at a time and really trying to figure out, all right, besides just the arts and crafts activity, how else can I incorporate that within their environment functionally um, to really work on that? Um, and I think, you know, helping me understand more with the symbol set and working more on that motor planning and that location versus really focusing on, all right, so the symbol for yes might be different on one system versus another, you know, that's okay, but really focusing on that location and motor planning um, is, is, was definitely a big takeaway and definitely a big help for me moving forward. Awesome. And something, awesome. I'll, add, something I'll add to that is, when I'm working with students with abstract language, because oftentimes, again, kids with autism are very concrete and they got a lot of nouns, but they don't have other parts of speech, which is why core words are so important. Mm -hmm. When I'm thinking about, you know, when is it appropriate to, you know, start with modeling two word phrases or start, you know, with the expectation um, of targeting a two word phrase, I really try to do a test on is this word generalizing to new things, um, which, you know, it, it's it, if the answer is no, it's not generalizing. It doesn't mean that you don't, you know, continue and move to two word phrases um, because sometimes, you know, these core words and these abstract language concepts take a long time for kids to learn. Um, you know, so again, we're balancing the words with, you know, success. Um, how many words do we use versus, you know, having success. Um, but I, I always am thinking like, is this, if I bring this brand new thing that they've never seen and we've been working on, you know, the, the, the core word go, for example, you know, if this brand new thing, like what will happen? Will the child actually find that word and use that word? Um, and that's kind of a, a, a litmus test to me to see kind of gauge where a child's at. Um, so okay. my maybe my last question is, you know, when you're when you're modeling language, um, how are you trying to facilitate more spontaneous language, or how are you gauging whether or not a word is generalizing to like a new activity? Um. I'm trying to think. So, I mean, I guess, you know, when I'm focusing on that generalization, I'm 
kind of thinking more about different contexts. Mm -hmm. Um, So maybe, you know, if I'm teaching that word to the child in my room, you know, then I'm trying to see if when he is moving around to different contexts, if he's able to use those words in there as well. But I think Mm -hmm. where I kind of need to go moving forward is, you know, for this kid specifically, I might be thinking about an arts and crafts activity within my room, but then also the same activity within the classroom as well. So I think I need to start thinking, you know, about the bigger picture and, you know, besides that specific activity, you know, what other ways it could be incorporated. So right now I'm more context based and more environment based, but I think I also need to just think about, you know, other activities and other functional ways as well. And you know what a really great thing that I do that I think that you might be able to utilize in your practice as well is ask the question to parents and teachers, what has he said this week? What has he said on his own without prompts? Mm -hmm, Like what mm -hmm. has he just said to you? Um, Because that tells us one, what kids are motivated by, right? It tells Mm -hmm. us exactly. It's like, oh, he said train, you know, he said train all all week long. Um, You know, so it it then gives us information, like what core word can I pair, you know, either in in place of or in addition to. Um, So that's one question that I ask. um, And it gives me information about motivation, but it also gives me, you know, information about what is this child saying spontaneously. Um, And I think as clinicians, if we keep checking in with what is a child saying without any help on our, like completely on their own, that gives us so much information as to, you know, where we can go and how we can build off of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I definitely think, you know, I've tried to be using that a lot, even now doing teletherapy with a lot of my parents because they're saying, you know, he's requesting water, he's requesting blocks, but now I'm kind of helping them to think, all right, so what would be the next step for that? And thinking Mm -hmm. about how can we put those two words together, such as drink water or, you know, play blocks. Um, So trying to, you know, incorporate that within there too, because those are words that they are using consistently, but now we want to build up. And what I might suggest is, you know, especially if he's using nouns, so say he's saying blocks, right? He's saying blocks, blocks, blocks. So instead of building to play blocks, I might just focus on play, right? Until he starts saying play and then he, it almost like magically happens, especially with Mm -hmm. students with autism. Those, once they start saying play, they'll start saying play blocks because they think through those concrete language you know, concepts. So it's like the blocks is what they think, but, you know, training their brain to think more abstract. Um, so I'm, I might suggest, you know, trying to think of what's the core word that I can focus on now. Um, okay. Play, eat, drink, go. These are all like ones that I start off a lot with kids because they're motivated by food, going places, yes. playing with toys. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe, you know, when, in thinking about pairing it back a little bit, um, maybe just focus on that single core word. Okay. That definitely makes a lot of sense and is very, very helpful. <laughs> Amazing. So do you have any other questions that are like burning questions that you want to ask? No, I think you guys, you guys definitely touched on a lot and you definitely helped me see things from another perspective um, as well, which I think is really going to help me a lot with a lot of my students moving forward for sure. Awesome. All right, Allison. Well, thank you so much. Thanks for, uh, for reaching out and for doing this coaching session with us. Uh, I know I really enjoyed it. Awesome. And, I ha- and I have to say, Allison, the fact that you sought us out and are so motivated to find these answers says a lot about what kind of clinician you are. So I really applaud you trying to listen to podcasts, probably do lots of webinars, um, you know, reading blogs. I know I, 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 we've just met, but I already know that's probably all the things that you're doing to try to support the students that you work with. And that's the most important thing. We don't always have all the answers, but as long as we're motivated to continue to learn and grow, that's all we, that's all we can ask for, you know, and that's all we need in order to continue to grow our, our skills as a clinician. So you're doing, you're doing great work. Absolutely. Thank you guys. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. <laughs> well, you'll definitely have to keep us posted on how it goes. Um, I feel like I'm so invested in this child. Now, so I, <laughs> please tell me. I will definitely keep you posted. <laughs> all right. Thanks, Allison. Stay safe, stay healthy. Thank you. You too. listen carefully. 
Hi, I'm Matt Hott, one of the hosts of Speech Science, a weekly podcast bringing you all the information that you can handle related to speech sciences and disabilities. Michelle Wintering, Michael McLeod, and I interview leaders and difference makers in the field. Every Tuesday, we drop a new episode. You can find us on iTunes, Android, and on our website, www.speechscience.org slash speech science podcast. Join us as we try to find the answers to the question, what is communication? You're listening to the Exceptional Podcast Network.